Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk today about bringing data layers into a QGIS map project and learning how to symbolize them and uh, in a couple of different ways and then also how to label them appropriately. So I'm going to start out with my, I've just opened up QGIS and the first thing I always do when I open up a new project is go to Project Properties. So I click on the Project menu, go to Project Properties and set my uh, coordinate reference system. And because I'm working in Vermont with pr primarily Vermont data, I do always set it to uh, Vermont State Plain NAD 83. If I was um, wanting to set it to, to a different coordinate system or if this was the first time I was coming in here and I wasn't sure how to find my coordinate system, there's a filter which essentially serves as a little keyword search. So you could type in, for instance, Vermont and you would see that I do get Vermont as my result. So once I click on that, highlight it to choose it, I just click OK, and I can, let me just go back to that for just a second. You can see that um, the Vermont uh, State Plane system has this little code associated with this EPSG code 32145, and I can confirm that I have set my uh, project appropriately by going down to the far right corner of my screen and you can see that it says EPSG 32145. So once I've done that I can start bringing data in because now if I were to bring in data that was in a different coordinate system as long as there's a projection file associated with it the software can do the transformation necessary to make sure everything continues to line up. So I'm going to add three data layers now to get started just so that I have polygon, line, and point. So you can see that this is automatically going to a uh, folder called, on my C drive, called Intro GIS Data. So this is the data that I use for a training I do during the summer. Um, obviously, if it hadn't gone here automatically, I would have just navigated here. And the data layers I'm going to add are town boundaries, major roads, and um, airports. So notice that I can highlight three different data layers here. I'm just holding down the um, control key as I do that and that way I can highlight all three that I click on and open all three at once. When I do that it doesn't put them in the right order so I am gonna fix that quickly so I can see everything. So um, again if anyone's not familiar with it, uh, with how GIS software works, it draws the image in your map area from the bottom up of your list. So we have a list of three data layers over here, um, a polygon layer showing town boundaries in Vermont, a line layer uh, showing major roads in Vermont, and then a point layer showing airports. And I wanted to make sure that my town boundary layer is on the bottom since, it, since it's an opaque polygon layer right now. Uh, so now that we have our data layers, we're going to go ahead and start changing the symbology. And in order to do that, I'm going to start with the airports. I simply right click on the name of the data layer that I want to work with. Go down in this context menu to properties. And since what I'm interested in is symbology, I'm going to make sure that I am in the style section. So QGIS refers to um, symbology as style. And this is where I can now manipulate my, my uh, how my data layer is represented. So initially, we have obviously some default settings here. It's set as a circle, default color, and this is somewhat random, um, comes in as purple, and it's, um, it's a pretty simple symbol. So all I want to do is show that I can change this to something else. I'm going to choose a, a triangle. I'm going to change the color to red, and I'm going to change the size. So the most important thing here is just to look around at all your options. <clears throat> you also have transparency settings. Um, you have a number of different symbols in here to choose from. And uh, for now, all I really want to do is change that to a different symbol, different color, slightly bigger size. And then if I wanted to play around with this more and try out different things, I could click the Apply button, and you'll see that it does indeed apply, but that it keeps the layer properties open. Since I just want to do that, I'm going to go ahead and click on OK. All right, so next, 
we're going to look at the roads layer. So once again, just right click on the name, go into properties, make sure we're in style, which generally it will be if that's what you just did. Um, notice that your symbol options are different because now we're looking at a line, a line uh, data layer. And we have some options here in terms of whether we want to go with a slightly fancier looking line as pre-symbolized over here, which we can then also change. We can pick something and then change a color, for instance. Um, notice that this symbol is slightly more complicated uh, in that we really have two aspects to it. We can change the, um, the fill of this two-part line. So in this case, we've got some light blue fill. We could change the color of that fill if we wanted to, maybe to gray. Um, we can also change the outline of that line. So here we've got brown. Maybe I want to change that to a dark gray. Um, obviously, you can change thicknesses of both. Um, we've got solid lines as opposed to dot dash. Also, a few options in there. Um, let's try this. I'm not very good with line data, so I'm just, I can't promise that we're going to have a beautiful map. We're just going to have a map where we can see what we need to see. So that looks a little thick to me. I'm just going to go back in there and see if we can make it a tad thinner. That's a little better. Okay, and finally we're going to go into our town boundaries layer. Change that color a bit. So uh, notice that one of the things you can change is the color. Now initially when I changed the color and the other uh, symbols, I just clicked on my drop down menu and it gives me some recent colors, just sort of a selection of colors. And, um, but, if, but if none of those is really what I'm looking for, I'm going to click on choose color. And here we have a bunch of different ways to change and choose colors. So some of them are predetermined colors that you can look at the swatches. There's a prism type thing where you can click. If you're looking for a blue, you can click different places on here and then click within the triangle to pick your color. Um, I'm actually, for now, just going to take advantage of the RGB option. So there's a color that I like, is a background color, that's just a pale yellow. And I know that the RGB values for that are 255, 255, and 225. I will say that QGIS's um, color selection window here has uh, chooser has changed and gotten a little more complicated in recent years, so I haven't explored all of the options in here uh, a lot, but there obviously are quite a few. So there's my nice pale yellow color. If I want to, I can, well, it's kind of done it automatically, but I can add it to my list over here and then just choose it. And now I've got a nice simple color. Now notice um, that just changed the fill. If I want to change the outline, I do have to click down here uh, where it says simple fill. And now I have the fill and the border kind of separated out. And if I want to, I can make the fill, or sorry, the border more of maybe a gray so it's not quite such a harsh boundary. Um, we can also change the fill style here. So if I wanted to do more of a, um, a dot fill or some diagonal hatching or vertical hatching, this is where you would change that fill style. And obviously, same thing with the border style. You can change the line to be dashed um, dots or whatever. And then the width of the border as well can be changed in here. All right. And so now I've got a more subtle uh, background color for the town boundaries. OK. So all we've done so far is take each data layer and click on properties, go into style, and change the symbology so that all of the features in that particular data layer have the same symbology applied to them. Simple enough concept. Luckily for us, we actually have some slightly more interesting options because we are dealing with GIS data, which means we can take advantage of the attributes associated with the data to have an influence over the symbology.
So um, all three of these data layers, so far we've done single symbol, which again means a single symbology for all of the features. But you can see if we click on the down arrow here, we have other options, categorized and graduated. We also have some others that we're not going to get into today, but we are going to check out categorized and um, graduated. So as soon as we choose categorized, it, uh, the rest of the, the box changes to give us some other options. So the first thing we have to do is choose a column or an attribute to, um, that, whose value is going to be looked at in determining the symbology for our features. So in this particular data layer, which is the airport's, airport's point data layer, there's a bunch of attributes in here. And unfortunately, the one that we're going to use is a good lesson in being careful about how you name attributes. This attribute is very unfortunately called miscellaneous. Um, and you'll see why it's really a poor name in just a second. So we'll leave it a triangle for now, or you can change the symbol if you choose. Uh, we can pick a color ramp. Now, keep in mind that the, what we're choosing to do right now is categorized. Okay, so what that means is we're picking a, an attribute. There's going to be values in that attribute. Um, but in this particular case, the values are not, uh, do not represent a, sort of a meaningful number. It's not an amount, anything like that. It's just a category. It's a number that represents a category. So random colors is actually probably the most appropriate thing to use. So I'm going to keep it on random colors. But notice that you do have other color ramp options that we'll try out in a moment. Now, we're still not seeing anything down here, so this is not, not very uh, interesting so far. We need to click on the Classify button. So we've set our settings up here, and then we go down to the Classify button and click on that. And you can see that, indeed, for each value in here, actually, they're not numbers, they're not codes, they're actually words. Um, for each value that it found, each different value, it assigned a color. So even though we have some number of attributes in there, 15 or 20 airports, um, each one that had the same value in that attribute is getting us going to be assigned a particular color. Now, I'm actually going to change these colors just because, for some reason, I'm used to thinking of these as red, green, and blue. No particular reason. But it is a good idea if your values, um, if a color makes sense for your values, make sure to think about that. I've seen maps where that isn't really done. and. Um, and it can be a little bit misleading on your map. In this case, municipal, private, state, there's really no particular color that needs to be associated with those. You'll notice that there's a fourth uh, symbol here with no value. So every time you classify um, with a categorized type of symbology, you're, the software is going to assign a final, an additional symbol, in this case an additional color, um, for any attributes that don't have a value in there. And I actually want to get rid of that. I don't want I don't think there are any attribute, any um, features that don't have an attribute in here, but even if there are, I don't want it to be included. So I can highlight this and actually just delete it out of my list of options. And now I can click on Apply, see how it looks. Looks good. And we'll go with that. So with that simple um, action, we've now really enhanced our map quite a bit. We've got information coming out of, at us beyond just where the airports are. We now know what types of airports there are in what places, how they're distributed about. Um, okay, now we are going to add another data layer a vector data layer, and notice we're just working with vector data today, so I have been using the Add Vector Layer button. And we're just going to add a county data layer. So it plops on there, and because it's opaque polygons, it covers everything up. But rather than move it, well, actually, I am going to move it but it's still going to cover up my town boundaries. And so what I want to do is take advantage of these county boundaries, but not have the polygons completely obscure the town boundaries. So we'll go into the style properties for this county boundary data layer. We are going to change from single symbol to categorized. And you'll notice that in order to um, take advantage of your attributes to um, 
to make your symbology more interesting, you do need to know your attribute data. So if you're not familiar with the um, the names of your various attributes and what they mean and what the values are, you will have to become familiar with them before you can take advantage of that, obviously. So in this case, I happen to know that the attribute called CNTY, county, is just a number code, whereas county name is the actual attribute that I would like to use here. Um, so I've got county name, random colors, that's fine. Uh, click classify, so you can see the different counties here and they're all being assigned a different color. If, um, if this map and the way that it was um, symbolized was extremely important, I would probably make sure in this case that uh, the colors that butt up against each other contrast well enough. We're not going to worry about that today, but that's just something to think about when you're doing a map like this that has a whole bunch of random colors. You just want to make sure they all kind of work out next to each other. But before I move away from this, I just want to change the transparency. So again, right now, all of these colors are still completely opaque, but just below my list of um, values and, and colors, we have layer transparency in the layer rendering area. And by just sliding this little slider bar over, I'm going to set it to about 65%. Um, I've now made the layer 65% transparent. You notice that it started all the way to the left, which means zero transparency, and it's telling you the value here. So I'll just apply that. And you can see that what that does is it allows me to distinguish between the counties by having them be different colors, but they're uh, transparent enough that you can see the town boundaries through them. So we get the benefit of both without um, without it being too distracting. And I'm, I apologize to everyone who's actually a good cartographer out there because I know that I'm not a good cartographer. I just try to do the basics here just to be able to sh make a point. All right. Um, all right, now we're going to move on to graduated symbols. I am going to abandon this particular uh, map project and start a new one. So if this was my final map, or, or if I was working on this map and I was happy with where I was at so far and wanted to see the work I had done, I would um, save my map, give it a name, it would be a .qgis file, um, but since this is just practice, we're going to go ahead and discard it. So here's my new empty map. Notice that it does indeed reset back to, I think it's just WGS84 coordinate system, so I do need to start from scratch, set my project properties to enable on the fly, Vermont, and then add in a few data layers. So we're going to do a, uh, a demographic thematic. A thematic map with demographic data. So once again we're going to put county boundaries and we're also going to add in cadash oh, oh sorry that's not what I want. Demo cow sub uh, 2010 which is um, census data. So cow sub refers to county subdivision and 2010 obviously refers to 2010 census. All right so there's my very exciting map that shows two opaque polygon layers, one that looks a little bit like that town boundary layer, although if you're familiar with Vermont, you'll see there's a few exceptions to that, um, but it is primarily equivalent to town boundaries. And luckily for us, this layer has a bunch of uh, data in it from the census, and we are going to represent that in our map. So rather than single symbol, we will go to graduated and now I need to, once again, tell it which um, attribute I want it to, to look at the values in order to symbolize it. And this is a good example of where it's important to be familiar with your data because this uh, data layer includes census data that still retains the census um, names, the names of the attributes. We didn't give them more intelligible names. And um, what that means is we need to know the meta have looked at the metadata to know that this is actually the uh, attribute that I want because this is the population attribute. So I've set that. Now because we have chosen graduated, we have some options about number of classes. 
also mode, meaning how it's now looking at a um, continuous array of, of possible values, and it needs to know how to break them up because there's, um, there are so many unique values. You obviously don't want to assign a unique color for every unique value of population. So it's going to divide them up into classes. And we're going to start out by actually setting this to quantile. And you'll notice that it says equal count. And we'll see what that means. And an unfortunate thing about QGIS is it no longer includes the, um, the count, actually the number of features that fit within each of these categories. Um, because if it did, you'd be able to see that for the quantile mode, equal count does indeed mean there's an equal number of features, in this case county subdivisions, in each of these categories. So that's actually how it determined where the breaks would be between these categories. The software looks at the data and it says, okay, there's this many features, we're going to divide it up by five, there's going to be this many features in each group, so the first, that number of features that um, come along define the, the um, population limit for that particular group. So you can see the first group goes from 0 to 627. So for those of you who are from out of state, this really is the population count for various towns in Vermont. Um, 0 to 627 and so on up. And each, um, the differences between the groups in terms of what the population ranges are can be huge, as you can see. And again, that's because the thing that is the same from group to group is the number of county subdivisions that ended up in this group. All right, so you can see we go from white to blue. I could change the color ramp if I want to. Um, purples, maybe we'll go with purples. And I think that's all I want to do for now, so go ahead and say OK. So you can see we've just quickly made a map that shows us where some of the higher population towns are, where some of the lower population towns are, how they're distributed around the state. If we go back in there briefly and change that mode to equal interval. So take a look at the, the intervals here, the, um, the population values for each of these categories before I change this. And then if I go ahead and change it, what you may notice here is that now, instead of having the same number of features in each group, what we have is the interval itself is going to be the same from one group to the next. So um, what it did was take the highest population, which is Burlington at 42,417, divided that by 5 and said, okay, so the first category is going to be 0 to 8,483. If you multiply 8,483 by 2, or 0.4 times 2, you'll see that that adds up to the um, high end of the next category. So it's going to go from 8,483.4 to 16,966.8. Um, what that means is that it very much changes the number of features that end up in each of these categories. So as you can see, we have very few towns in Vermont that are above 8,483 and even fewer above 16,967. So um, the way that you choose to represent this, this um, the data, the graduated data, has a huge impact on your map. So you need to think about that and either talk to a statistician or pick the map that looks prettiest, but just be clear about how, you've, how you have decided to um, deal with the data. All right. Um, now we are going to add some labels on our map. So um, actually I'm going to go back because it is prettier with the quantile. So I'm just going to stick with that for now. Okay. So we're going to label the map with uh, county boundary names. And so once again, I'm right-clicking on the county boundary layer, going into properties. This time, instead of style, I'm going to go into labels. And actually, um, well, no, we'll leave this here. So first thing is you'll see there's a checkbox, label this layer, label this layer with, actually. And so the first thing we need to do once again is point at the attribute that we would like uh, the software to use to label. And the only other thing I'm going to do right now, I'm going to mostly leave the defaults except down here in buffer. So notice that each of these 
words in this area are indicate a section. So in buffer, I'm going to go ahead and draw a text buffer. Leave the defaults. You can obviously change these defaults if you want to. The size of the buffer, the color of the buffer is by default white. Um, lots of things you can change here, but I'm just going to leave those and then say OK. So all that did was very simply apply uh, uh, county labels, county name labels. Uh, so right now we've actually got that county data layer underneath the uh, census data, the, the county subdivision boundaries, but our labels are showing up on top, which is nice. But maybe we also want the county layer um, for the benefit of it to use it as a boundary layer to actually show those county boundaries. So we're going to drag the demographic data underneath. So now we've hidden it, of course, and we're going to change the symbology of our county layer so that it can serve as a boundary layer, uh, just showing boundaries. And go back to style. So here we need to click on simple fill and notice the difference here if we had a more complicated symbology, for instance, actually if I just do this, you'll see that um, the reason this breaks it down is because in this case we have now a point pattern that's showing up on top and a background color. Um, if we go back to a more simple type of a thing, we just have simple fill. But we can change our color. Now, there's actually two ways to make this um, hollow, essentially a hollow polygon. We can choose transparent fill right up here at the color swatch at the drop down arrow. We can also, in fill style, choose no brush. Either of those will result in a hollow polygon. We still have our border that we can um, pick a color for, pick a thickness for, there's border width, try that. Um, and of course we've got border style as well if we want to change that. Let's just see how that looks. It's a little bright but we can see it. <laughs> Probably a little thick too. Maybe make it just a little bit thinner. So now we've got the labels and the boundaries showing so that we can see where our county boundaries are. Um, another neat option in our uh, symbology and labeling options is to use scale dependency so that uh, when we zoom in on our map, we don't keep seeing exactly the same uh, labeling and actually even well, we're not going to get into that today, but we can also set scale dependency to show layers or have layers not show at different scales in exactly the same way as we're about to do with labels in a slightly different spot. So what um, do I want to add in? Oh, actually, let's add, let's go ahead and add the um, labels on the county subdivisions or the towns first, just so we can see that it's going to look a little crowded if we just have them all on there. So I'm just in that county subdivision layer. Again, I know that name 10 is the attribute that's going to give me my uh, town names. Clicking on buffer, so I can draw a text buffer with, with this type of symbology. It's somewhat hard, challenging to get um, the right color on your label, so having a text buffer is a really easy way to make sure it stands out. And, all right, so now we've got a big crowd of town names. We don't really want those to show at um, this fully zoomed out scale. At this scale, we really just want to see the county names. But when we zoom in more, we'd like to see those town names. So let's set some scale dependency in our labels. So first, I'm going to go back to the county labels. And I'm going to go down to rendering. So this is where, I, as you can see, I have scale-based visibility options. So I'm going to turn that on. And rather than my minimum being 1, I'm going to change this to 350,000. Hopefully I've got the right number of zeros. So think about what this means. Um, also keep in mind that this is one of the reasons that we always set our uh, 
our coordinate reference system when we start is so that the software knows what the units are in our data and uh, it helps you both with um, measuring if you need to measure on your map but also in this circumstance where we are concerned about scale based visibility it needs to have an accurate idea of the scale so when it knows the units of our data um, for instance Vermont State Plain is in meters it needs to know that in order to have an accurate uh, depiction of scale so we've now set it so that this these labels will only show if we are zoomed out to a scale of at least 1 to 350,000. Alright, so if we're at a scale that's smaller than that or larger than that actually, um, we shouldn't see those labels. Similarly, on the town labels, we're going to go into rendering, scale-based visibility. Now this time we want to set the maximum to a limit because we don't want these labels to show when we are out beyond 350,000. Okay, so we've gotten rid of our town labels and if we go ahead and zoom in a bit we should see, so um, before I zoom in anymore. Notice that down in the bottom of our map project we have the scale being shown to us. So in this case it's a scale of 1 to 388,846 at the moment. Click in one more time and I've now gone to a scale of uh, 1 to 194,000 which is obviously a larger scale than 1 to 350,000 so now our town boundaries have shown up. I'm sorry, town labels. If I zoom back out a step, so you can see that the county labels are showing right now. And when I zoom in, the county labels are actually gone and the town labels are here. We can um, be even a little bit more specific about this by setting the scale directly. Oops. So if I just highlight whatever numbers are in the scale <clears throat> box and then type in 350,000, I don't Notice that I don't have to type in the 1 and the colon, I just have to type in 350,000, it knows what to do with that. And then hit enter, so now it's at a scale of 1 to 350,000. So apparently the way this works is that when you set your minimum, that's an inclusive minimum, whereas when you set your maximum, which is what we set for the town names, um, that's an exclusive maximum. So if I set the scale now to 1 to 349,999, we get the town names and not the county names. Okay. All right, and that is pretty much what I had planned to talk about today. So this is your opportunity to ask questions. Um, obviously what we covered today is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I'd be happy to fool around with some of the other settings in there. Um, as you saw, there's a lot to change, and so I'm happy to do that, but I want to make sure people have a chance to ask about the basic stuff first uh, before I try to get too fancy, especially given that I don't actually have um, a lot of skill and knowledge with some of the fancier settings in the, in the um, labels and symbology. Okay. Um, so Jessica asks a question that is actually going to be answered in our next webinar which is not currently scheduled but I'm hoping I will be able to schedule soon for sometime in March. Um, she asks how do you title or legend a map to print? So how do you put a title or a legend on your map? Since as you can all see this is a pretty bare bones map <laughs> and I don't, um, I could actually put some text on here but that isn't how you would deal with it. Um, I will briefly say that there is a function in here, if we go up to the tabs and tools and things, um, come on, hover, generally when you hover over things it tells you what they are, it's not for some reason. Um, this is the print composer, so these two icons that look kind of like a horizontal piece of paper, one of them has what looks to me like a snowflake, but I think it's supposed to be a symbol that means like new, something new. When you click on that, it says, oh, you're going to create a unique print composer title, uh, you're going to 
create a print composer, now put a unique title in here. So if I just call it my map, that's just the name that it gives to it. So now we're in uh, print composer mode, and here's my map that I am now about to compose. As you can see, it's just like when you start um, a project. It's completely blank. You have to start adding in all your elements. And so what you would do is add in your map element, your titles, your legend, um, and we will go into that in more detail in the next webinar. Or you can actually look at an old webinar that I've posted on our YouTube page that, that shows that process as well. Any other questions out there? I might go in here and see if I can find any interesting uh, options. All right, if your data set has something, say a county more than once, how do you get ah, the label on it just once? All right. Um, Trying to remember if the placement option gives you that. No, let's just see. So the question was if you have, say, like a multi, um, a multi-part polygon, or if you have um, a feat. Basically, if you have multiple features that really have the same name, and you only want them to be labeled once because functionally speaking it's really only one object. Um, how do you avoid having it be labeled multiple times? And I'm not sure I know that right off the top of my head. I was wondering if there was an option in here to set that, but I don't think there is. So if anybody knows the answer to that, feel free to type that in. Um, the only the only thing that I can think of is that in that case you might actually end up manually labeling things if it's something that um, is easiest, most easily dealt with in workaround format <laughs> by simply manually labeling rather than automatically labeling, especially if it's something that you can easily get that one label off and add one label, or if, um, I'm not sure what you would do if you had that problem throughout your map. Um, you might have to come up with a different solution for labeling than automatic labeling. So I apologize, I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, how did I pick the scale of 350,000? That was honestly somewhat arbitrary, somewhat based on the person who actually um, wrote this manual many years ago, I think said it that way. <laughs> and because of the size of Vermont, it just kind of works and makes sense. Um, and how do you manually label? Yeah, I knew that was going to be the next question, David. Uh, let me just close this. Okay, up here somewhere we have annotation. So um, so text annotation just means writing something on your map. So up just do that one more time to make sure everyone saw. So there is a symbol up here that looks kind of like a call out, and then there's a little drop down arrow. There's a few different ways that you can do this, and again, I haven't done a lot with this, so it's a little dangerous for me to try some of the other options, but text annotation just means literally manually writing something up here. So you can see that it automatically puts in some text, QGIS rocks. If I double click on it, I now can label this Um, you have a certain amount of control over this, but it's obviously not the same as a nice label. Again, it's, it's pretty much determining that it's going to look like a callout. So that's one way to label. It's not necessarily the best, but... Uh, and actually, I just want to... Um, background, we can make background transparent, we can make frame transparent, so so we can, um, I could make the color white, everything else transparent, oops, that didn't work, where did that not work? There we go. 
Well, it doesn't seem to want to let me do that, but it's all right. So there's your manual labeling. Not ideal, but it's a workaround. In your legend. Uh, somebody is asking a question about the legend. In my legend. Um, yeah, there's a question that's a little too brief. It just says, in your legend, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking or telling me. Oh, there we go. Um, in your legend, I see that 627 values repeated twice. Oh, that's, um, to be honest, I think that's just, let's look at that for a second. Okay, so Sam, I think, is pointing out that... Um, the values, the, the categories, uh, appear to have the value say, at the beginning and end of the range in both both uh, categories. I think in reality, it's in terms of the actual values, it's not doing that, but I think that might just be an oddity of that nobody noticed that that doesn't make sense for labeling the legend. And I have to admit that I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to check... Um, I would have to dig into it just a teeny bit to figure out which category the 627 was actually being put in, for instance, in the one, the 1099. But it obviously is it's making the break somewhere, so it's putting the value in one or the other, not both. That's a good question, though. Any other questions? So maybe I should stay in there for a moment. Oh, okay. That's a good point. So um, that's something I didn't point out. Uh, this column is showing you the actual values that it's finding and that it's using to create the categories. This column is actually what appears in your legend. So, um, oops, what did I just do? Oh, there we go. Um, so for instance, I could make sure that my legend labels Oops. Say this if I need to, and this can be important if um, I'm trying to remember the map I just made recently where I did this. You might have something that's really representing codes. Um, for instance, with the with the airports, we didn't have codes, but if we had had codes for municipal, private, and state. Um, it would have said, you know, value 1, 2, and 3, and over here it would have said 1, 2, and 3. But if what I really wanted to say was municipal, private, and state, I can just double click in here and edit this and change this. And then that will actually show up in the legend that you put on your um, map in your print composer. So that is nice to be able to manipulate that, to edit that. Uh, I was just trying to think if there's anything else I want to point out in here. Obviously you can change the font. Uh, the style, the size, the color, the transparency of your text in your labels. Um, maybe I should point out down here in rendering, or actually, sorry, in placement. So sometimes with things like our town labels, town name labels, labels um, if we did actually want them to show up at this scale or at a slightly more zoomed in scale, but, but what tended to happen was they overlapped each other or they kind of knock each other out because if they overlap, the software really doesn't want to have overlapping. So sometimes you just won't see some of the labels. You may need to look at your placement options and um, or if also if you have two different sets of labels that seem to be competing with each other a bit, you can um, you can determine that some of the labels maybe are going to be a little bit more to the upper left and some perhaps to the lower right. You can also determine uh, set that certain um, data layers labels will have a higher or lower priority, which means if they do conflict, the one the layer that has the higher priority will show and the layer that has the lower priority actually won't show the label. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think what else I'm familiar with in here. You can obviously rotate your labels, give them an angle. Um, you can offset them from uh, from the feature itself. So if you don't actually want it on the feature, but offset from the feature, you can set that. We can obviously do shadows. You can have a background on your label rather than just a buffer. Um, 
Okay, I think those are most of what I wanted to point out in there. Uh, I also just, let's see. Yeah, I guess just point out that when you get into slightly more complicated symbol options, you do, generally you can dig right in there and, and change everything. So in this case where there's a point pattern fill, you can change the spacing of the, the points and, you know, pretty much all as I shouldn't say all, many aspects of it are fairly easy to change. You just have to remember to click on stuff and kind of dig in a little bit to find it. Ah, can you label in a curve along a line? That is an excellent question, and I don't think I've tried that yet. Uh, do I not really have any curves, but um, add the road data back in here. Let's see. That's not what I wanted. Sorry. Um, just so I can see it. All right, let's try labeling the road. This would not be the <laughs> the um, layer that I would use for this. All right, text formatting, background placement. Ah, yes, curved. Above line, on line. It's not going to be pretty, but let's look at it. And this isn't a great example because the they're not. Whoops. Sorry. There. So you can see that it is indeed. So once you're labeling a line feature, you can go into the placement section and you can choose curved. Good question because I hadn't tried that before. And again, notice that you can, you can, um, you can position your labels a little bit away from the feature. So this would be an example where you might want to do that above the line a little bit. That gets it off the line just a bit. Okay, any other questions out there? My beautiful purple map. There we go. Okay, I think if we have covered everything that everyone can think of, for my level of knowledge at least, um, hopefully, if nothing else, this will inspire you to go out and um, gather more information if you need to. If I haven't covered as much as you'd like to, to um, find, I encourage you to go do a Google search, go do a YouTube search. There's a lot of QGIS training out there and a lot of videos. So um, if you're looking for something more in depth, I'm sure you can find it. And if you, and I really appreciate if you'd all take the time to answer the uh, survey that will pop up when you sign out. Uh, the information that you give me in that is really helpful, and I always use it. So thanks, and I hope everybody has a good day. And remember, this will be posted probably within a few hours. Thanks.